Amen. All right, so uh, we are in week five of our series, In His Image, where we're seeking to discover God's divine blueprint for manhood and for womanhood. Uh, next week is our final week in this series, so we're moving toward a close pretty quickly. Uh, but I've, I've really been praying that this series would give people a compelling vision for their manhood or their womanhood. Uh, I talked to a couple ladies last week after we talked about woman's purpose uh, after the service, and they said, this series is making me happy about my womanhood. Like, I'm not, I'm not trying to be a man anymore. I'm, I'm excited that God made me a woman. They said they're excited to host village and to find a husband and to raise a family because they see the goodness of God's design for them as women. That's exactly the kind of thing that I'm excited to get to hear. And so in case you've missed any of the last few weeks, I want to review the ground that we have covered because this is the type of series that kind of builds on itself week after week. And so uh, we started the series, week one, by talking about the similarities between men and women. Right? God made men and women fundamentally different, but we have similarities. We are more the same than we are different. Uh, men and women are the same in that we are not God, which means that we must be humble. We are not animals, which means that we must be disciplined. And we are not children, which means that we must be responsible. During week two, we zoomed in on the purpose of the man to find out what is true about a man that is not true about a woman. We read about Adam's creation in Genesis 2, and we identified the primary role and the primary virtue of the man. So here's what we found week two. The primary role of the man is headship. It's headship. Headship is the unique leadership of the man in the work of establishing order for human flourishing. It's the primary role that God made men for. Uh, the primary virtue of the man is strength. Strength. Strength is the unique power of the man to overcome obstacles and withstand strain. That's how God designed men. So we concluded week two with this statement. Men are designed to use their strength to establish order for human flourishing. Men are designed to use their strength to establish order for human flourishing. That's how God designed men. Now in week three, we talked about man's hurdles. What are the common pitfalls or the common failures that men often fall into? We turned one chapter over to Genesis 3 and found that when men fail, they either fail by abdicating their headship and strength or by misusing their headship and strength. And so we have two ditches here. When men abdicate their headship and strength, that is called passivity. When men misuse their headship and strength, that is called tyranny. And, and so for us as men, God has a glorious vision for our manhood but in order to become that kind of man, we have to examine ourselves and by the power of the Spirit, through the gospel, put to death the areas that we are being passive or tyrannical. That's the Christian life of the man. And then last week, uh, week four, we switched the focus from men and began talking about women, specifically the woman's purpose. Just like we did with the man's purpose, we went back to Genesis 2 and we identified the primary role and the primary virtue of the woman. So here's what we found last week. The primary role of the woman is life bringing. Life bringing. Life bringing is the unique ability of the woman to cultivate physical, social, and emotional life within her sphere of influence. Cultivating physical, social, and emotional life within her sphere of influence. The primary virtue of the woman is beauty. It's beauty. Beauty is the unique disposition of the woman that draws attention to things that glorify God. It's a disposition that draws attention to things that glorify God. And so we concluded last week with this statement. Women are designed to use their beauty to bring life to the world. Women are designed to use their beauty to bring life to the world. Uh, let me tell you a story about a woman that you should know something about. Um, in the 1950s, a team of college-age missionaries set out for Ecuador because they heard that cannibalistic native tribes had been discovered that had never been reached by the gospel. Now, two of these missionaries were Jim and Elizabeth Elliot. Uh, Jim and Elizabeth, along with their teams, they began a four-year process of establishing contact with the Aka Indians of Ecuador. Uh, they dropped food and gifts from an airplane on weekly trips. They learned the Aqua language from nearby tribes, and they made a plan to finally establish contact, personal contact with the Akas. On January 8th, 1956, Jim and the four other men on their team loaded into an airplane and landed on a sandbar next to the Aqua village. Uh, Elizabeth and the other wives, they stayed back at camp and waited for radio contact 
And after Jim and his team missed multiple radio calls, they sent a plane to scout the area, and they found that all five men had been speared to death on the beach right after they landed. Now, for most people, this kind of savage and heartbreaking attack against your husband would make you want to resent the villagers, right? And, and maybe even scheme a way to get revenge, right? We're, we're going to bomb this whole village now. That would be the impulse when you endure something like that. But Elizabeth Elliot was a woman dedicated to God's design for her, to use her beauty to bring life. That's what she wanted to do. And so instead of seeking vengeance, Elizabeth and some of the other wives traveled to the Aka village. They got on a boat and they traveled to the Aka village. And when the villagers saw the women arrive unarmed and realized that these were the wives of the men that they had just killed and left the bodies on the beach, they realized the truth of the gospel that those missionaries had been trying to proclaim to them, that had been giving them through their messages. And Elizabeth, she moved into the Aka village and began teaching them the Bible. There's this really cool picture here. Elizabeth's grace and gentleness and persistence led to almost the entire tribe of Akas being converted to Christianity. The Akas became a civilized, godly, and missionary-minded people. In fact, in the years that followed, Akka villagers, including one of the men who personally speared Jim Elliot to death, led missionary efforts to reach other Ecuadorian tribes in the area. Elizabeth went on to be a prolific writer and speaker and advocate for missions and for godly womanhood. She wrote a book called Let Me Be a Woman. And in the book, she said, I don't want anybody treating me as a person rather than as a woman. Our sexual differences are the terms of our life. And to obscure them in any way is to weaken the very fabric of life itself. When they are lost, we are lost. But when those differences are lost, we are lost. So if you young ladies, if you're looking for a role model that you can learn from and read about, uh, Elizabeth Elliot would be a great choice for you. In 2015, at 89 years old, Elizabeth Elliot went home to be with Jesus. She was a woman thoroughly dedicated to using her unique beauty to bring life to the people around her, even when those people were only bringing death. That's the kind of woman that Elizabeth Elliot was. That's the picture of godly femininity that we looked at last week. So if you missed one of those weeks, I'd encourage you, you can jump on YouTube, you can get caught up, especially if you feel like you're missing some important context this week. And so that's our recap. That's what we've covered the last four weeks. Today, uh, we're going to talk about women's hurdles, some of the unique pitfalls that women face. Um, If you've been been around the church, not just our church, but around the church for a while, you might have picked up on this funny trend where most men's retreats are a bloodbath, like like 48 straight hours of being told that you're a loser and all the activities are just designed around making you feel incompetent. That's basically men's retreats in a nutshell. And then women's retreats, it's like a spa day, right? That's the first day. And then all the teaching is about how you are precious and worthy and beautiful. And your real problem is that you just don't love yourself enough. That's your main issue. Uh, and then for the activity, like you make a, an affirmation board that you can put on your bathroom wall, right? So that every morning before work, you're reminded of how worthy you are. That's what women's retreats look like. And, and call me, uh, maybe I'm old fashioned. Call me old fashioned. I, I don't think it should be that way. I don't think it should be that way. Uh, men are glorious and men are sinners. And women are glorious, and here's the dangerous part, women are sinners. Men and women are both sinners. Men sin, and we do it a lot, and we do it in specifically manly ways. And women sin, and they sin a lot, and they do it in specifically womanly ways. And so, because of my respect for women and for womanhood, I'm going to talk about the hurdles of women in exactly the same way that I talked about the hurdles of men. We're, we're going to use the same framework. Just like the men, women's hurdles directly relate to her design. The man is always in danger of abdicating his headship and strength or misusing his headship and strength. And in the same way, the woman is always in danger of abdicating her life-bringing and beauty and misusing her life-bringing and beauty. And it's this abdication and misuse that we're going to talk about today. And so before we open to Genesis 3, uh, a couple quick comments similar to what I said when we were talking about the men's hurdles. Um, First, any of you fellas that are sitting next to your wife or your girlfriend, if you get the urge to, you know, play the part of the Holy Spirit or play the I told you so game, uh, resist that urge. 
I promise you, you're not helping. Your gentleness and your grace will go much further to convict her of her sin than you needling her, elbowing her, guilt tripping her. That's not how it works. So trust that God is going to speak to her. Uh, And number two, to you ladies, I need you to remember that all of us, men and women, are in process. Like nobody's nailing it. You've never met a person who is nailing it. Everybody is in process. And, And so please resist the urge to pretend like you have it all together. Resist the urge to pretend like you are nailing it. Uh, Resist the urge to pretend like you don't struggle with these things. The church should be the safest place in the world for people to be honest about where they're at, to be honest about their issues, because the church is the only place in the world that people gather specifically to admit that they need help, right? Like that's why we're here, to admit that we need a savior, We are incapable, we are lost and broken, and we need a Savior. And so as you process this stuff, I want to encourage you, you can feel confident that you can be vulnerable with the people around you, knowing that Jesus already washed your sins away. You are already made clean in his blood. You can be honest with the people around you, uh, because they're in the same boat. They are also a mess, and we are all a mess. And so with that established... Uh, Let's turn to Scripture and see the common pitfalls that stand between women and God's design. So turn with me to Genesis 3, if you have a copy of Scripture. Now, at the start of Genesis 3, we have the man and the woman together. They are in the garden. They've been tasked with turning all the chaos of the world into the beauty and the order of the garden through generations of faithful multiplication. That's the, the commission. And they only have one rule. Do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so I know we read this passage a couple weeks ago, but it's good to review, and and this is a great story for us to to really know. So we're going to start in verse 1 and read through Genesis 3. Verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. So Adam and Eve decide that they are not content living under God's authority. So they decide that they want to become gods themselves. That's the decision to eat the fruit. They disobey God, and they plunge the human race into sin. And let's see how God responds. Verse 7. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And so God confronts the man and the woman and the man blames God and then blames the woman and then the woman blames the serpent and nobody takes responsibility for their sin. And now as a result of their rebellion, God is going to curse the serpent and the man and the woman. There's three curses that are being laid out. So let's read the curse to the woman. Verse 16, to the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. Now in this text, we see uh, the origin of all human sin and all the difficulty in the world. Adam rejects God's design for him by sitting passively by while his wife is deceived. Eve rejects God's design for her by taking headship of her family in place of her husband. They both reject God's design by switching places. And ever since this moment, both manhood and womanhood have been broken. And so let's look at the two ditches that women fall into. Remember, these ditches are directly connected to the role and the virtue of women. The woman's primary role is life bringing. The woman's primary virtue is beauty. 
So here we go. When women fail, they fail in two ways. In two ways. Number one, women fail by abdicating their life bringing and beauty through contentiousness. And number two, women fail by misusing their life bringing and beauty through vanity. Contentiousness, abdication leads to contentiousness. Misuse leads to vanity. Now, let's take a deeper look at these two ditches. Uh, Number one, contentiousness, the the abdication of the woman's life bringing and beauty. Let's read verse 16 again, where God curses the woman. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. Now, there are two curses here, and both of them relate to the woman's role as the life bringer. First, first, childbirth will be much more painful. That the woman, as the life bringer, has the unique responsibility to create and carry and sustain and birth new human life into the world. And because of sin, that entire process is painful and it's difficult and it's messy. Uh, Second, God says that the woman's desires will be contrary to her husband's. In other words, the woman will have a natural tendency to be rebellious toward her husband's leadership. So because of the fall, the woman is naturally predisposed to fight against the man's headship. That's the curse here. Naturally predisposed to fight against the man's headship. God gives the man the role of headship, and then in the curse, he tells the woman, you're going to have a hard time with that headship thing. You're not going to like that a lot of the time. Uh, A few weeks ago when we were talking about the man's purpose, I said that the primary role of the man is headship, and and I saw quite a few of you ladies kind of bristle up at that. Like it was a jarring word to use, right? How dare he say that? I'm an independent woman. I don't need to be led by by any man. That's the Genesis 3.16 curse working itself out in your life. It's that disdain for the man's headship. At its root, This disposition to fight against the man's headship is an abdication of the role and virtue of womanhood. God designed the woman to be a helper fit for the man, the perfect complementary partner to come alongside the man and work together. And so when the woman refuses to be a woman as God designed her and instead tries to play the role of the man, she is abdicating her life bringing and beauty. She's neglecting or rejecting God's design for her. And this abdication of life bringing and beauty is called contentiousness. Contentiousness. Uh, Because of the curse of Genesis 3.16, there's a temptation inside every woman to deny her role as life bringer and reject the beauty that God has given her and to instead act like a man. And this temptation is exacerbated by our culture that is constantly telling women that the way to be most valuable is to be just like a man. That's the message that you're receiving from culture, right? Last week, we talked about uh, the theme of these, all these female-led movies that are out there today, right? Captain Marvel or She-Hulk or Ocean's 8 or Ghostbusters or Hunger Games or anything like that. The, the women in these movies are manly, they're snarky, they're loud, they're aggressive, they're disagreeable, and they are insufferable to be around. The, these movies pretend to be empowering women, but really they're telling women that true womanhood is found in acting like a man, That's not empowering to women. Uh, There is is a little bit of an aside, but I I think it's valuable. There's a reason that every great story in all of history has the same plot line. Like there's one plot line in all of storytelling. Hero saves damsel in distress. That's the story, right? Kill the dragon, get the girl. That's the one plot line of every great story. Now, sometimes it's a literal damsel, like Braveheart or Princess Bride or Tarzan or something like that. Sometimes it's a metaphorical damsel, like Lord of the Rings or Star Wars or the gospel. If we pick up on that, right? Jesus slays the dragon of sin and rescues the girl, his, the, his bride, the church. Uh, but, but that is always the plot because the hero saves damsel plot line is true like down to the very foundation of our creation. That storyline is woven into the fabric of reality as God created it. Damsel in distress movies work because they are true at a cosmological level. And girl boss stories fail because they are fundamentally false and in rebellion against God. And and so uh, you ladies have an internal temptation to be contentious. And then you have an external pressure on you from our culture to be contentious. And I want to help you today identify those areas. 
And so just like we did with the men, uh, I want to list some common examples of contentiousness so that we can have some, some practical handholds, so we can, we can see it in our lives uh, a little bit. So here we go. Uh, I got six. Six examples of contentiousness, six examples of vanity. <clears throat> uh, for the guys, I gave you ten, so I'm being nice here. Um, number one, first example, nagging and quarrelsomeness is contentious. Nagging and quarrelsomeness. Uh, the Bible has quite a bit to say about nagging, a, a nagging and quarrelsome wife. Actually, a lot to say. Uh, Proverbs 19.13 says, a wife's quarreling is a continual dripping of rain. Proverbs 21.9 says, it's better to live on the corner of a housetop than in a house shared with a quarrelsome wife. Like, it would be better to live on the roof than to be in this house. Uh, Proverbs 21.19 says it's better to live in a desert land than with a quarrelsome and fretful woman. It'd just be better to be in the desert than to be here with with this woman. Uh, Just as tyrant men use their strength to get their way, contentious women use their words to get their way. That's the way they manipulate people. And so this is things like harping on weaknesses and failures, grumbling, complaining, bringing up the same thing again and again, always finding something to fight about, not giving grace, never expressing thankfulness, backseat driving, cattiness, pettiness. These are examples of nagging and quarrelsomeness. Uh, Ladies, God has given your words tremendous power, tremendous power because he wants you to use them to comfort, to encourage, and to build others up. But that means that your words can also be used to do great harm. You can create life with your words and you can create death with your words. You can take life with your words. So think of your words like food. Think of them like food to the people around you. Uh, Some of you ladies, I know you, you care a ton about eating healthy food, right? You're all about um, avoiding chemicals and microplastics and food dyes, and yet your mouth is a constant stream of complaints and nagging and nastiness. I'll be totally honest with you. I would rather eat an entire bowl of red 40 toxic food dye than sit in a room with a nagging and quarrelsome woman. That should be in the Proverbs. It probably would be if it was written today. So ask yourself, are you serving up the hot and nourishing food of gratitude and thankfulness and grace and joy with your words? Is that how you use your words? I guarantee you, every single husband in this room would rather come home to a dirty house with no dinner and a joyful wife than a clean house with dinner ready and a bitter and complaining wife. Guaranteed. Uh, Now, I know some of you are thinking, well, then how do I get him to start doing blank, right? Whatever thing he doesn't do. How do I get him to stop doing? If I can't nag him, what am I going to do? I just encourage you. There is a way to engage with your husband that is encouraging and life-giving and leads to transformation. And there is a way to engage with your husband that will incite his flesh and cause him to dig his heels in. Nagging and quarrelsomeness makes him dig his heels in. They are in the second category there. So that's one example of contentiousness, uh, nagging and quarrelsomeness. Number two, disrespectfulness and unsubmissiveness to your husbands. To your husbands. Disrespectfulness and unsubmissiveness to your husbands. Uh, In 1 Peter 3, Peter's talking to women, and he says, verse 4, But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart, with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious, For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Wives display their beauty when they have a gentle and quiet spirit that obeys and submits to their husbands. When women take up the the Hollywood feminist attitude toward their husbands, that is an abdication of their beauty. Uh, Proverbs 7.11 says, She is loud and stubborn. Her feet do not stay at home. Now, this isn't necessarily saying that her volume is too high. It's saying that she is boisterous and tumultuous. She's like a roaring storm that is out of control. She's using all of her energy for herself and for her desires instead of for the good of her family and for her home. So when the women, again, take up this kind of this Hollywood feminist attitude or they become rebellious and hyper-independent, they are abdicating their beauty. So disrespectfulness and unsubmissiveness to husbands is contentious. Uh, number three, intentional ugliness is contentious. Intentional ugliness. Uh, when women are in rebellion against God, they often try to tear down the beauty around them. 
They want to tear down the beauty around them. So sometimes this is the beauty in their surroundings, like you know, throwing paint at a mural in the museum. You've probably seen those headlines on the news before or creating grotesque artwork or things like that. Uh, sometimes this beauty is in themselves, right? Like chopping all their hair off and covering themselves in markings and piercings or not taking care of their health and their hygiene. The, the ultimate expression of this intentional ugliness is the trans movement where they mutilate their female body parts in rebellion against God. That's the ultimate expression. God designed women, God designed the woman to be the glorious, shining capstone on all of humanity. Women are made to exude beauty and create beauty because beautiful things glorify God, the creator. And so when you intentionally cause ugliness, you are abdicating your virtue as a woman. Intentional ugliness. Uh, Number four, disdaining children is contentious. Disdaining Children is contentious. Uh, The Bible clearly teaches that children are a gift from God and that women are designed uniquely to create and birth new children. So when a woman disdains children, she is explicitly rejecting uh, God's design for her as a life bringer. So this could look like uh, believing children are a burden. It could look like choosing careerism over motherhood. It could look like being annoyed or disgusted by other people's children. Or the ultimate expression of disdain for children is being pro-abortion. Right? Both the Bible and every embryology textbook on our campus say that human life begins at conception. And so the, the idea that we can just kill our children to keep them from hindering our life goals is a pretty clear rejection of life bringing. That is, disdain for children is contentious. Uh, number five, laziness is contentious. Laziness is contentious. Uh, sometimes people think that if, if it's the man's responsibility, the man's the one that's primarily in charge of providing for the family and working outside the home, then that means the woman can just sit around and drink wine and watch TV all day. Right? That, that's kind of the trope. But God designed both the man and the woman to work hard. To work hard. In Proverbs 31, here's how the ideal woman is described. It says, She seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She's like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from afar. She rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. She considers a field and buys it with the fruit of her hands. She plants a vineyard. This lady is all over the place. She is working hard for the good of her household. She's not sitting around watching The Bachelor. That's not what we see in Proverbs 31. Uh, For most of human history, the, the woman bore primary responsibility for the nurture and education of the children in the home and for the general upkeep of the entire household with no technology to help. Like there weren't any machines that did any of this work for us. But then in about 1950s, you know, like post-World War II era, all of that changed. The public school system meant that houses were now childless for most of the day. And then new technology like washing machines or dishwashers or vacuums or whatever meant that almost all of the work was effortless. It was very, very quick. And so now these women had tons and tons of time on their hands and nothing to do with any of it. And so a lot of these women resorted to activism, which is what gave rise to the first feminist movement, right? the first wave of the feminist movement. And then a lot of them resorted to laziness just spending their time reading and watching TV and going over to the neighbor's house and gossiping. That's why that is the stereotype in all the old movies and books. If you ever watch like an old movie, that's the the housewife stereotype, Uh, drinking wine and watching TV and gossiping with the neighbors. So ladies, God made you to work hard, just like men made you to work hard. And he's commanded you to work hard. You should fall into bed exhausted at the end of the day, just like the man should. Now, your work is different than the man's, undoubtedly, but that doesn't mean you don't have to work. Laziness is abdication of your role as life bringer. And number six, our last contentious example, emotional manipulation is contentious. Emotional manipulation is contentious. Using displays of emotion to get your way is contentious. So, This could be crying during an argument so that no one can oppose you. This could be playing the victim. This could be being weepy or pouty or whiny. Uh, This could be expecting people to cater to your anxieties. Expecting everybody else to cater to your anxieties. In leadership circles, this is sometimes called tyranny of the most anxious person. In every group, there's the tyranny of the most anxious person. It's when people expect you or expect an entire organization to cater to whoever is the most anxious or the most uh, unstable in a moment. So this, a really good example of this was COVID, right? 
Every business, every school, every church was expected to follow the orders of whoever's the most freaked out. Whoever's the most anxious makes all the rules. Everybody is expected to follow them instead of looking at the data, dealing with populations as a whole, doing those things we would normally do. So expecting people to cater to your anxiety is emotional manipulation. Uh, Another example, creating an ethos of emotional chaos and unpredictability around yourself everywhere you go. That, That is emotional manipulation. Life can only thrive in emotionally predictable environments. Right, have you ever talked to a kid that grew up in, in a bipolar type home where you never knew what mom or dad was going to do, how they were going to react to anything? Those kids, they could never feel safe expressing themselves or asking for help. To be a life bringer, you must make your context more stable, more predictable, more reliable, not less. If you bring emotional chaos everywhere you go, you are abdicating your role as a life bringer. So that's, those are six examples of contentiousness. Uh, now, that's not an exhaustive list by any means, but it should give you an idea of some of the most common ways that women tend to fall into contentiousness t- today. They tend to abdicate their role as a uh, life bringer and their virtue uh, of beauty. And so that's one ditch, uh, contentiousness. But there's another ditch on the other side, uh, another hurdle that women struggle with just as much, and that ditch is vanity. Vanity, the misuse of the woman's life bringing and beauty. Now, when most people hear the word vanity, uh, they, they think being obsessed with physical looks. That, that's what our mind goes to. But it's much broader than that. I'm using this term much broader than that. So remember how we defined beauty at the beginning of our time today. Uh, we said, beauty is the unique disposition of the woman that draws attention to things that glorify God. It's a unique disposition that draws attention to things that glorify God. So beauty is the ability to make things attractive and marvelous and splendid in a way that brings glory to God. Vanity is the ability to make things attractive and marvelous and splendid in a way that brings glory to yourself. That's the difference between these two things. Vanity is not just about being obsessed with your looks. It's about orienting your gifts in a way that takes glory away from God. And brings glory to yourself. Uh, When God created woman to be the the shining capstone on the human race, he gave them immense power. Everywhere you go as a woman, you cause glory. You just do. It it exudes out of you. You can't help it. Women cause glory. They capture attention. Uh, they, They draw attraction. They earn appreciation. The question is, where is that glory directed? Where does all that glory go that you cause everywhere you go? A godly woman directs all that glory to God, while a vain woman directs that glory to herself. Now, this might feel a little bit vague, but some practical examples will probably help. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to go through these a little faster than the last, the last one. Uh, common examples of vanity. Number one, comparison is vanity. Comparison, the, the belief that your value or your identity comes from what you look like, what you achieve, what you own. Uh, That is comparison. When you operate in comparison, you're looking out for ways that you can receive more attention or more glory. That's what comparison is functionally doing. So this could look like bragging or insecurity or shopaholism or jealousy or envy. Uh, This is why social media platforms, especially Instagram, have been shown to have way more serious negative side effects towards women. It's because social media platforms are designed to create comparison. They feed off of your comparison. Comparison is an attempt to direct glory to yourself, which is vanity. Uh, Number two, gossip is vanity. Using your words to tear others down rather than build them up is vain. It's trying to steal glory for yourself instead of giving it to God and to others, redirecting it somewhere else. So this could be slander or jealousy or coveting or backbiting or secret sharing, telling people things that you said you wouldn't tell. Uh, Ephesians 4.29 says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Gossip is vanity. Uh, Number three, immodesty is vanity. Immodesty is vanity. Uh, This is another topic that we're often afraid to talk about, but the Bible is not afraid to talk about. Uh, 1 Peter 3, we've read this a few times in this series, Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. Uh, 1 Timothy 2, 
The Apostle Paul says, I desire then that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel, with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. What is proper for women who profess godliness, good works. So in these verses, Peter and Paul are naming things like gold and pearls and braided hair because those were the common ways that women dressed to draw attention to themselves in that day. That's what's going on here. These women would go out in public dressed in a way that draws attention to their externals. Look at me. Look how pretty I am. Look how rich I am. Look how important I am. And Paul and Peter are saying that instead of dressing like that to draw attention to your appearance, you should dress yourself in the kinds of things that draw attention to God's work in you, to to your heart, to your hands, and to your good works. Now today, the common expressions of immodesty have changed. Right? We rarely see a woman walking around in a, a big gold headdress and big pearly flashy necklaces, but we do see women walking around in revealing or non-existent clothing that's designed to draw attention to the body of the wearer. Now, I'm not going to give you some list of like, here's the clothes you can't wear and here's the clothes you can wear. That, that would be silly. That's between you and God. It's between you and your huddle. It's between you and your husband. But here's what I would encourage. When you get ready to go out in public... Look at yourself in a mirror, honestly, soberly, and ask, does my appearance draw people's attention to the goodness of my heart and the works of my hands, or does my appearance draw people's attention to the shape of my body? Does it it draw people's attention to the works of my hands, the goodness of my heart, or the shape of my body? And now, Every time this issue is brought up, the common objection, so I'm going to cut you off in case you're um, already, already getting ready for the Q&A. You're going to skewer me at the Q&A. The common objection is, I don't dress this way to draw attention. I dress this way because it's comfortable, right? That, that's what everybody says every time this is brought up. And so listen, I get it. I, I get what you're saying, but guess what? Your comfort is a very low priority to God. Your comfort is not God's highest priority. There are tons of things that are comfortable but are entirely inappropriate for public places. Uh, Both Peter and Paul make it clear that modesty is about what your attire does to people's attention, not what you want it to do to people's attention. Did you catch the difference there? It's about what it actually does to people's attention, not what you want it to do or what's in your heart about what you are wearing. If I walk down the street in a clown costume... It doesn't matter what I want people to do. It doesn't matter if I want them to stare at me. They're going to stare at me. So that's the dynamic that we're dealing with here. Now, modesty is definitely not exclusively a women's issue, but women will deal with it more acutely than men will. Immodesty is vain. Uh, Number four, flirtiness is vanity. Flirtiness is vain. Uh, This is the intentional or unintentional use of beauty to woo men into inappropriate relationships or situations. Uh, Proverbs 7, again, talking about this same woman who is loud and stubborn and and doesn't stay at home. It says, "With, With much seductive speech, she persuades him, and her smooth talk, she compels him. All at once, he follows her as an ox goes to the slaughter. Uh, Now, some women do this intentionally, right? Acting as a seductress, trying to coerce or convince a man into an inappropriate activity. Now, some do it out of sheer desperation for male attention, right? They're not necessarily even looking for a sexual partnership. They just want a man to approve of her or give attention. And this is especially true if a woman has a bad relationship with her father. There's a desperation for male attention. But honestly, in my experience, most of the time that flirtiness happens, it is totally unintentional. And the woman is just naive to how men work. They don't understand how a man works. So this is the common friend zone trope, right? This is where all the friend zone stuff comes from, where the girl says, oh, him? No, he's just my guy best friend, right? That's what's going on here. Meanwhile, the guy is head over heels in love. He's trying desperately to figure out a way out of this friend zone. Uh, Ladies, I'm going to tell you a secret. This is a guy secret, okay? You're not supposed to know, but I'm going to let you in on it. Um, Yeah. (laughs) The mutually platonic guy best friend doesn't exist. It is not real. It is not real. It does not exist. Now, you can have guy friends or guy acquaintances or whatever that are platonic and all totally normal, but 
if you have a guy that you spend lots of time with and you text him and you Snapchat, Snapchat with him and you cry on his shoulder when life gets really hard, that guy is in love with you. He is 100% guaranteed in love with you and you are leading him on. You're leading, now, he should probably take responsibility and make it clear what he's feeling, but you are also leading him on. And so if you're not sure if you're in that kind of situation, you're not sure if you're being flirty, I would encourage you, ask some women around you. They see it. They're aware. They can see what's going on and they'll tell you what is happening. So flirtiness is an example of vanity. Number five, harshness toward people who do things a different way is vanity. Harshness toward people that do things a different way than you. Uh, God has naturally designed women to want to do what's best for the people around them. Right? That, that's the life-bringing thing. But that good desire can twist into a judgmental and stuck-up attitude toward people who do something different. You, you can start to believe the lie that anyone who's doing something different than you must be wrong or stupid or evil. And this temptation, I've, I've found, gets much stronger when you get into adulthood and you have a family. That temptation starts to get stronger and stronger. Um, mommy pages on Facebook or mommy TikTok accounts, they're the epitome of this. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go find one of those. That's exactly what I'm talking about, uh, right? Like people have been raising kids one way for thousands of years, and then a new study or a new product comes out, and all of a sudden, every mom acts like, if you don't do the new thing, you hate your child. That's the vibe on all of these pages. If you don't believe me, go on a mommy page on Facebook and say, just type, this is easy, just type, my three-year-old doesn't sit in a car seat. What do you think is going to happen? You will have thousands of angry women descend on you in the comment section, acting like you just typed, uh, I am currently carrying my child up the side of the volcano to throw them in. That's what they're acting like you said. Even though like one generation ago, the thought of having three-year-olds in a car seat was ludicrous. Now we act like there's no other way. And if you do it any different way, you must be evil. Or tell them that you spank your kids. Go on a mommy page and say that. You will immediately get somebody, oh, really? Uh, you enjoy beating little kids? I hope you enjoy having a traumatized child who hates you when they grow up, as if every person in world history wasn't spanked up until 30 years ago, right? So there's just this trend to, um, to, to want to be really harsh toward people that see it a different way or do it a little bit differently than you. Uh, it, it's a misuse of your role as, as life bringer. It's a misuse of your beauty when you are harsh toward people that do things a different way. Uh, number six, last one. <clears throat> coddling is vain. Coddling is vanity. Uh, coddling is, uh, this could be the overbearing friend or the smothering mother. Those are common examples. When you coddle, you're bringing life to the wrong things. Right? You're, you're doing the life bringing. You're just doing it toward the wrong things. You are cultivating codependence and anxiety and helplessness and perpetual childishness in others because you refuse to set appropriate boundaries. So in friendship, this could be the friend who uh, always says what the other person wants to hear, whether it's true or not. That, that's a coddling move. Uh, this could be the, the mother who won't let her child overcome obstacles or deal with a scraped knee or let her kids be around the other kid that's a little bit mean or a little bit of a bully. That's the coddling mother. Uh, this could be the parent that spends $10,000 a year on AAU soccer and misses church every single weekend because they're just sure that their kid is the next Ronaldo, right? We see that happen all the time. You are misusing your life bringing by bringing life to the wrong thing. You're bringing life to the wrong thing. So coddling is vanity. Now again, this isn't an exhaustive list. We could, we could come up with some more stuff. But the goal is to help you see the ways that women often fail, often have hurdles in our world today. So the two ditches women often fall into. One more time. Uh, contentiousness is the abdication of the woman's life bringing and beauty. Vanity is the misuse of the woman's life bringing and beauty. I think on the back side of your notes, we have the, the completed full diagram that has all, uh, all the different main points from this sermon series in it. Uh, ladies, I know that you are bombarded day in and day out with the message that you have to be contentious, manly women in order to be valuable. And then you're bombarded by the message that you have to be vain, manipulative women to get ahead. But you need to know that God has a better design for you. God's design for you is better. God has designed you to use your beauty to bring life to the people around you. That when you trust that you belong to Christ, that he has taken your sins away, that he will carry you into eternity, then you are freed up to laugh in the face of our culture 
and live as God designed you to. You don't, you don't have to give it an ear. You can just laugh and then continue living as God designed you to. So let's move to application. I'm getting close to the end here. Uh, two applications, one to the women, one to the men today. Uh, women, examine yourselves and see where you are being contentious or vain. Examine yourselves. Where are you being contentious or vain? Where are you abdicating your life bringing and beauty through contentiousness? Where are you misusing your life bringing and beauty through vanity? Uh, as, as I read through these lists, there were probably some that kind of jumped out at you right away, like they were obvious. Um, but I would encourage you to really dig through this deeply. And to do that, you're going to need some women around you who know you deeply and can see your issues. There is stuff inside you that you can't see. You need people around you that can see that. And so just like I encourage the men, you women need to get involved in discipleship groups. You have to get involved in that kind of an environment. Our truest, deepest transformation doesn't happen here on Sundays. This isn't mainly where it happens. It happens in living rooms when we are face-to-face with people who know us fully and love us fully. And so if you want that kind of discipleship, you can ask your village leader. They would love to, um, to get you set up in that situation. Number two, men, examine yourselves to see where you are tolerating or rewarding contentious or vain behavior in women. Uh, are you encouraging contentiousness by treating the women around you like men? Right? Do, do you include them in all the guy talk? Do you rough house and joke with them like they're your bros? All that's doing is teaching them that to get along, they have to fit in with the guys. Or are you rewarding vanity by allowing your attention to be so easily grabbed by immodest dress or seductive actions? When you walk into a room, guys, does your attention automatically gravitate to the woman showing off her external beauty or the woman displaying her internal beauty? Where does your attention go right away? Because that's what you are rewarding. Men, train yourselves to notice the traits that God champions in a woman. And train yourself to ignore the traits that our culture champions in women. That's how you will find a woman that will be a wonderful wife and a wonderful mother to your children. Now, if this, uh, if this sermon sounds like bad news, if it sounds like a, a long check, checklist that makes you feel inadequate, I want you to know the Bible doesn't end in Genesis 3. In fact, that's right, right there toward the very beginning. There's a lot more that happens. When God curses the serpent in Genesis 3, he prophesies that one day a man is coming who will crush the serpent's head and free mankind from their sin. And next week, as we close this series, we get to talk about how we as fallen men and women have been redeemed by Jesus, the snake crusher. That he has already come, he's already put sin to death. Jesus didn't leave us in our failure, but he forgives us from our failure. He gives us his own righteousness and he empowers us to walk in God's design. That's really good news, and that's what we get to talk about next week. So I hope to see you there. I hope you'll, you'll be able to come back. Uh, I want to invite the band to come up here and join me, uh, and I'm going to pray for us.